Hey friends, I'm David Rice. Welcome back to Dentistry Unmasked with my partner in crime as usual. Hey everybody, Pam Maragliano Muniz. And today's guest is awesome. He's going to help me with a problem. So, oh my gosh. And I think a lot of practices can relate. So I don't want to talk about the C word, but I'm going to sort of bring it up. So in 2020, when we reopened our offices, it was like opening the freaking floodgates, right? It was like every patient that like under the sun just like needed to get into your practice. And I remember us being crazy overworked and overwhelmed. And we were like, oh, I don't want to like not be grateful, but I hope this will settle down and calm down. And here we are four years out. And that really hasn't happened minus like flu season and people, you know, call out that kind of thing. But I think a lot of people as a result are like, oh, you know what? Maybe I just won't market anymore. Maybe I just won't do whatever. Maybe I can just dump the jerks in the practice, like try to like figure things out to make things even up. But there's actually a mindful approach we can take to really like even things out, but continue the growth and not make it such a zoo. So with us to help us understand what we can do for our practices and our our sanity is John <laughs> Riley. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Pam and David. I'm excited to be here with the two of you. I love your podcast. Thank you. So, you know, it's fascinating, Pam, because I find we talk an awful lot about um, what do I do to bring new patients in? And we don't talk enough about what do I do when I'm doing well and my hygiene department is busy and, and, and how do I build a strategy and how do I have a vision and take advantage of this moment as opposed to maybe squandering this moment, waking up in six months or a year and two years and feeling like, whoa, I, I missed it. So John, like I'm so pumped to hear how we maximize this opportunity when we're seeing this in our practices. Oh, yeah. And, and this is what I get to wake up every day and help doctors doctors do. But you just nailed it, David, is that when 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 doctors get this point of when they're just so full and they just can't see straight, they're frustrated, they might be losing patients or whatever. They they don't understand that this is actually when they might be in control of the practice when it might feel out of control. Right. So this is the time to say, what can I do to be able to now become a master sorter with the maybe the patients that you don't really want that are kind of wasting your time? Yeah, I'll tell you, one of the things I really appreciate is you foundationally have kind of like four levels mm -hmm. to, you know, how you how you look at a practice. And and Pam, you had a thought, so run with it. But like I feel like those four levels sort of come into play when a practice is in this position. Yeah, I think hit us with the four levels and then I will I will chime in. I mean, I you know, it's it's just interesting that as a practice owner, you know. And it's almost like we go in phases, you know, and I think that, exactly. you, know, you know, it's one of those things where we're like, all right, right now we're focusing on being too busy, you know, but, you know, then all of a sudden, like, I don't know, like school vacation week comes and like things happen. And then all of a sudden it's almost like feast or famine. And Perfect. and I know right. it doesn't have to be that way. So hit us with your four levels first and then let's. You I'll bet. I'll give you a <laughs> thirty thousand foot view of the of the four phases. I that could spend you know hours and hours on. There's so much depth to it. But I'll give you the four phases and why are, why are the four phases of practice mastery? We created this uh, post COVID for this exact reason that uh, really helping doctors to understand putting them in control and you know really giving them the the levers that they can pull at any given time. And the four phases of practice mastery is a, is a tool that every doctor is on this journey at some point in that process in these four phases. So I'll just go over them to you really quick and then we can kind of break them down. Phase one is where every doctor starts. It's really a, a web presence foundation uh, or phase is that this phase is absolutely critical. It's kind of like perio is that a lot of patients want to get to the sexy veneers, right? But like, hey, hold on, we got to take a step back. We got to take care of that those five millimeter pockets, right? In order to have a good foundation to build upon, or else those veneers will not adhere. They're not going to, going to stay, and it's not good dentistry. So, therefore, same thing goes when it comes to to marketing. Is that the phase one is really about getting your foundation on Google to be so good that Google makes 
you look good because why? You're first making them look good. We always have to play by Google's game. It's crazy, I know. Some people are just so adamant against Google, but hey, Google controls the market. 90, 95% of the, the market is, is really Google. There's a, there's some other players in there. But if we make Google look good first because everything's aligned with all your um, attribution, so all of your listings, all your website, all of your social media, all those components have the same exact content, they're same, the, the same brand and vision of who you actually are, doctor. Um, that's that's what the Web Presence Foundation is because if you go to any one of those listings and it's different information, Google dings you because you're no longer congruent, right? So that's phase one. That foundation doesn't take long for a doctor to, to get that. I mean, we can do that in, in three, four weeks. It doesn't take long. They can stay in that phase for as long as they want because it's a it's the doctor's goal, not ours. Phase two is when a doctor has that foundation, then they then they say, okay, now I'm ready. I want to I want to start growing my business. And they kind of like veneers, they've been wanting to grow their business, but we had to take care of that foundation first in phase one. So now they've graduated to phase two. Now they're ready to uh we're, we're probably 80, 85% of doctors kind of reside. Um, and uh it doesn't mean they stay there, but they all start in that phase one, phase two mode, the growing their practice with better fee-for-service style patients, really attracting a better patient in the practice. That's the core fundamental of phase two, right? There's not much uh, other sizzle to it besides really just getting that foundation of uh, really building the, the the lifeblood of your practice, which is new patients, right? And then ultimately, we believe that the future of your practice is built in hygiene. So now those patients are going into hygiene, accepting treatment through through hygiene, and then of course the the doctor's column is is full with restorative. That phase two is where every doctor um, starts along with phase one, but they they get those two in place. Now they can really determine: Do I want to take my practice to the next level? Phase one and phase two are what we call uh, needs-based phases. They need that, right? And uh, so needs-based phases are handled, let's say. Now they're ready. Now they have a full, like we, we started talking about here today. Now they're ready to, to say, okay, I'm full. My hygiene's full. What do I do? Do I step back in marketing? Or do I become even more intentional about sorting, pulling some levers, going into phase three, which is the profitability phase, getting out of those nasty PPOs, Maybe uh, this is, again, the doctor's call uh, saying, hey, is it time that we uh, now stop seeing children because we don't want to see children? We'll leave children for the pediatric doctor. Then as they age out, we'll get those patients back. Um, that's phase three is really the profitability phase. Why is phase three one of the most critical phases of all the phases is because a doctor gets paid. Right. And uh, and now we can match their clinical skill and their uh, patient base they're now the same. Now we can have a patient that's really attracting a better patient into the practice. Uh, they, the doctor's happy, you find more fulfillment. Then when they say, okay, now I'm out of PPOs, now phase four comes in, which is the lifestyle and career phase where these doctors can now say, I've been trained in implants or I've taken all these amazing courses through Ignite and Ignite DDS and, and now I'm ready to start doing a lot more uh, clinical dentistry that I've never been able to do because I've been doing inlays and onlays till the cows come home because of uh, those PPOs. Now that I'm in control, now I can start doing implants, all in fours, full arch, IV sedation, whatever it is that they you know aspire to do. That phase four is not just a service oriented, it's really a lifestyle fulfillment phase reduce your doctor days, enjoy more time with your family, uh, increase revenue per patient, increase revenue in the practice. So those are the quick overview of the four phases of practice mastering. Every doctor is in one phase or another at some point, and it's really just help giving them the courage to say, now I'm in control because I'm packed. Now let's move to the next level. This sounds like a natural progression to the life cycle, if you will, of a practice as it, a doctor matures. But could you be doing this in a different order? Like, could you be feeling like you're overwhelmed and being like, I got to get rid of this? <laughs> or, you, or you get, I mean, a lot of people we talk about all the time about, you know, emotionally breaking up with third party payers. Like you, you know, you yes. they have a big case, they kind of screw you, you're like pissed and you're like, I'm just going to dump them. And, <laughs> you know, but maybe their foundation isn't there. Like, so is there a perceived, you know, like, is there like ways that you think that you're at level three, but you really, really need to kind of get back to the basics? Like, how do you identify right. if 
you're not in order here. Yeah, great. Fabulous question. Great question. Well, in that situation, we wouldn't take the doctor back to phase one, right? We would say, hey, let's fix as we're as we are in process of your what we'll say treatment plan. But in this situation, the strategic plan for their practice is that if they just joined us and they've been marketing and they've been focusing on you know implants or this or that or the other, and they just haven't realized, well, I can't really ever seem to make it, right? Well, the PPO companies might be taking all their revenue and they don't have a good foundation on in phase one. So what we would do is say, hey, listen, let's fix phase one while you're still in phase three, which is getting out of those PPOs. Because like you said, doctors out of emotion, they might say, I'm out, just get me out now. And so they might be running down that path and not really have a plan. And so we might help to come in and save them to where it's a, it's a matter of uh, making sure that you're dotting your I's and cross your T's in that situation to keep as, retain as many of those patients as possible. But the four phases of practice mastery is not a, um, it doesn't need to be uh, a, um, a, a a series, you know, going from one to the next. It can absolutely be in parallel. We have doctors all the time say, I want to do phase one, phase two. I won't even start phase three right away, right? When that doctor is going to be investing more to do that because we need to make sure that we're building the foundation for the patients that they will lose in, um, you know, dropping a PPO, but it all can be done depending on what the doctor wants. I like that. So it feels like um, we can each be in control of our destiny. It's really based on I'm gonna say one, maybe like stomach muscle. How, <laughs> you know, how, exactly. how fast do we think we can run this race? And then, yeah. and then two, I think it's about trust and in, in the wallet muscle. And the more exactly. I'm willing to invest at one time, the, the faster I can go. And, and, and maybe the more I need to build trust and do this, I can go a little slower and, and work myself through. Right. You just nailed it, too. I'm going to give you a quick example. We have a doctor in um, Washington that started uh, with us, and he, his goal was he bought a $700,000 practice. His goal was to be at, at $2 million within three years. And he, he says, well, I'm, I'm going to start out, John. I'm going to, I'm willing to pay you $2,000 a month. And I said, I said, hey, I'm grateful that you're willing to invest, but we're actually not going to take you as a client. And he was like, why would you say that? And I said, well, because it's kind of like someone saying, I'm ready for full arch dentistry, but only willing to give you $2,000. <laughs> it's just not going to cut it, right? So it's not about a dollar figure. It's about, are we going to be able to stand behind the return on investment at that point to say, you're, so if they were going to invest 2000 in this situation with his goals being so high, he's not going to get there. Therefore, our name is on his practice and I would be setting our, our company up for failure if we brought that doctor on board just because he was willing to quote unquote pay us. Just like a patient saying, I want Invisalign uh, and uh, and yet they're five millimeters deficient on their maxillary arch. They're not a candidate uh, for Invisalign, right? Even though they're willing to pay you $5,000, same kind of situation. So I told him what the proper investment was and he goes, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Well, you just said it perfectly is that this point he starts to get that trust and then he's he went all in he he uh over quadrupled his actual marketing budget this is not about selling anything right here at all this is zero but in his situation he wanted to be at that two million dollar mark we got him at that two million dollar mark from 700 to two million in in like 16 months uh and because it was his how aggressive he wanted to be and tying everything together. We have doctors all the time that say, hey, I'm gonna start real slow. I'm really slow and methodical. It's your practice, doctor. We run at your pace, not ours. I need to give a little shout out or an acknowledgement to some of the practices that are still struggling with not having enough hygienists or not having right. enough team members here. And I feel like some of them might hear this and say, all right, that also well, sounds well and good, except it's not a reality for mm -hmm. me in my practice because I'm currently crippled by not having the workforce behind me to right. properly grow. So what do you say to a practice like that? Because there's certainly a lot of them out there. Uh, absolutely. It's like we, it, it, you would not want to invest in marketing to drive in more patients if you're not able to see them. That's just plain and simple. So what we would want to do is really develop a strategy to be able to make sure that those doc, those those patients that they're so for instance if that if that practice um had uh, an abundance of patients but didn't have the ability because they don't have the team members and we've saw this all throughout you know from 2020 till now is that we've seen so many doctors 
that they didn't have the team to be able to support the growth, right? And and so what we said is that let's let's make sure to tailor it to fit your current situation because we don't have a point of diminishing return. We want to make sure that your dollars are being invested properly. So so what, in those situations, we would look at, is there any PPOs that would could reduce your stress level? And and you let's say if they didn't find uh, an assistant. I, a good example of a doctor in, in um, Knoxville that had that lost three assistants, single doctor lost three assistants in in uh, you know post COVID, and uh, he didn't know what he was going to do. Right, so well, of course we're not going to say keep the gas down. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? So we everything is tailored to fit that practice. So in that situation, what we did is said, listen, let's let's reduce. This is the time right now to reduce the PPOs, the ones that are not paying you well because you can't afford to take those on when you when you have the potential of losing good solid fee for service patients. So if if there's you know Dr. Smith that we're talking to right now that's out there that has that situation, you're actually in control or you can actually focus on let's say you're looking at your all your different what we call people groups, right? You have let's say 30 different people groups with every types of insurance, fee for service, um, uh, you know, um, membership club, and then all the other PPOs and non-PPOs is we have to look at it and say, well, what, what people group is not really wanting to get healthy? This is your time to be able to say, those are the ones that you should drop and done strategically. Of course, I'm not telling them to say, do go do it right now after the end of this podcast. But the piece is, is that it can be done strategically and you can find uh, many minor wins while you're looking for good team members. I think that's important. I think that's a great example of, of you know, where you were sharing earlier um, based off your question, Pam, where sometimes those phases run parallel with each other and all of a sudden we think we're here, but we need to pull this phase back in and um, getting your house in order is, you know, yeah, going to be critical to people's success. So you, you have one of the coolest things um, you've shown me in the past, like you have a, a tool that that helps yes. to show me if I unplug X uh, PPO or Y PPO the impact it has on my practice based on my patient and my demographics. I think that's a really um, strong asset that practices. You know, the Pam and I we talk about data all the time. And that that's hard data we can use to make great choices. Oh man! Yeah, tell it, us more it, about that tool. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, it's so good. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, you'll love it. This is actually uh, funny. It's not meaning to be, I'm serious here. It's called the practice assessment tool that we lovingly call Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not a fancy name, but Pat is been the best friend of doctors since, you know, since 2021, since we created it for this exact reason, is it putting doctors in control? So what this software has, it has uh, eight different modules in it. This is not what I'll say today's dentistry. This is really tomorrow's dentistry. There's a lot of good softwares out there that run today's dentistry, a lot of the big ones. And if doctors use them and they're they're uh, um, integrated with it, great, keep using that. What this software is, the most unique software I've ever seen, and I'm grateful that our team has created it. A uh, um, well, team member of ours, his name is Tyson Edwards. He's just a genius. And uh, what we did is we created this software to help doctors understand what is my tomorrow look like? What is my capacity? So there's a capacity simulator with, with let's say a practice has four ops uh, and they're doing, you know, a million dollars. I'm just going to make it up. And they want to go to six ops. What is that going to do? It's not just a, a 50% more, but what's that going to do with the team? How How's it going to max out the team? How soon is at the current pace with new patients and everything else, the new patients, the, the collections, the uh, the the uh, conversion with the treatment from the doctor, with all of those things, hygiene production, all of those things, how quickly are we going to get uh, to six ops full and maxed out? When do we need to add another hygienist? When do we need to add another associate? Um, and a good example is a doctor says, hey, I think I'm going to be maxed out in the next year and a half, two years. And they need to figure out when am I going to start needing to build uh, or buy or move my practice because I don't have any, you know, these four walls are as far as I can go. So these six or seven ops is, is the max. Well, this gives the doctor the ability to just kind of see into the future, uh, a capacity simulator that gives them the, the ability to see into the future to where the, it gives them certainty because it's all their data. So we can tap into open dental 
EagleSoft and, and um, uh, Dentrix right now, which covers, you know, to close to 85% of the market. But the uh, long, long story short is that that's one of the modules. And I'll go over just a couple more. There's there's not, there's a lot of other stuff that's in there that uh, we can go production, you know, per per doctor and so on. But they can get a lot of that in um, uh, in their own software if they know how to, you know, function with it. But the keys to this one, there's three core areas uh, besides the um, uh, capacity simulator. The other one is, that's phenomenal is the PPO analysis is that this analysis, we can tell us, okay, you could afford to drop 32% of your patients and actually come out on the plus side from a collection side, because we know where they're at from a fee for service standpoint, where they're at with this bottom dweller PPO, uh, XYB PPO. Then we know that, okay, you could drop 32%. The average is 15 to 30% that you're going to drop. We don't ever guarantee that they're going to drop you know, 36% or 26% or 15% because it's really dependent on how the goodwill of the doctor, how many PPOs are in the area, how many or how many uh, patients use those PPOs in the area with other businesses. But we know the average is 15 to 30. So this tool will then give the doctor confidence to go, oh, I, I didn't even think about because they always think loss, right? I can't afford 25% loss. They're thinking collections. It's not collections. Is that this tool helps them to see, oh, I could lose 25% of my patients but gain a quarter million in revenue and open up 250 slots in my schedule. Now you want to go from 184 days down to 160. Well, this is the this is how we do it. So that's that's the capacity simulator and the uh, insurance uh, simulator. Then the other key point, there's actually two other like top models, top modules. Is the other one is an area where it's a, a financial candlestick uh, to where we get to see what areas of their practice, even though that we're not a CPA and we never will be, or we, uh, we're we not you know, a wealth manager, we want to look at everything from a financial standpoint. Why? Because if the doctor is hemorrhaging money out of you know, one or two areas of their practice, they should know about it. We just point it out and say, go talk to your CPA, go talk to your wealth manager here. You need to really look at these different areas and fix those because if you don't fix those, I don't care how good we are at marketing, you're hemorrhaging money out the back door because those those things are out of, you know, it could be supplies, it could be your, your overhead, it could be this or that or the other. Um, and uh, it gives them the tools to go, oh, I need to go look at that. Or no, I actually know that because I'm intentional about my supplies and I have the, or the, the best lab on the planet. So I'm willing to be in, you know, at the hundredth percentile or whatever, because they're all benchmarked against other doctors. Then the last area is what we're excited about. We just launched is a, a fee service, uh, a fee schedule review to where we can actually look at, and it's a, a whole process that we can actually show graphically, not just from a spreadsheet, but show graphically how the doctor is in comparison to all their fees, which ones are, are kind of standouts uh, and which ones are absolutely low. And you put it graphically, then they go, oh, I can see that this one and this one need to be raised right away. I have no idea why they're at the 45th percentile. Let's get those up to 70%. Now, if it's a gateway fee, we're going to recommend like with, with exams and cleanings and so on, we're going to recommend that they don't ramp those up so quickly because again, that's what patients understand. But if it's a non-gateway fee uh, that that patients kind of like the lube and oil filter, everybody knows it's going to be between 49 and 79, right? If it goes up to $179, like, whoa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go find somebody else, right? So these four modules, along with others, really help to understand what's tomorrow's practice, what's the opportunity, what can I do in these four walls with this team or expanded team? And it really gives doctors the assurance that I'm moving in the right direction or I need to. This is so interesting. I have to ask you, David, because I feel like you hear this and you're like, wow, that sounds great. This is awesome. And I think that there's something to be said for an objective approach to what may or may not be going right in your practice. So David, you've had a practice for a long time. Did you ever receive objective information that forced you to take action on your practice? Like, and how did that feel? Because I feel like this all sounds great, but I think that there's like a, maybe a discomfort or maybe a little anger that might take place that might prompt an action. I, I love that. And um, so I feel like this is confession time. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, I have received objective data on my practice. And I'll tell you, um, these are not the phases of emotions you go through if someone passes away in your family. But the first one is like cold sweat. Oh my gosh. 
because I think um, as humans, we have a tendency to either be like super optimistic and we, we find the good in everything or we're pessimistic and we find the problem in everything. I'm kind of an optimist guy. Yep. So I was finding good in all these things that maybe there wasn't good in. It felt great, mm -hmm. but it wasn't great. Um, emotion two was, okay, deep breath. What are we going to do about this? My choice is ignore the data and just put my blinders on, which I could have really easily done. Um, I have a, I'm like a, um, a great cornerback. I can forget letting the guy score a touchdown on me in 10 minutes, but we, you know, thankfully my partner, Mark is a, a smarter man than I am in, in a, in a, in a very analytical guy. And Mark was like, well, no, listen, let's, we, we have it in front of us now. Now we just have to have a strategy. And, um, I think John, to your point earlier, um, we could bite it off a little piece at a time where we could take mm -hmm. big bites, but that's a great question, Pam, because it was hard to hear really hard to hear. So dentists, when you're listening and watching, it's going to be hard to see. It's going to be hard to hear. Um, we're not talking about social media where we all make $20 million a year and take 14 weeks of vacation a year. The reality is no matter how healthy our practices are, there's stuff. So don't be afraid of your stuff. Get some objective data, face the music, and then address it a bit at a time. How about mm. you, Pam? Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I could go <laughs> on and on for days about the crazy stuff that's gone down in my practice, but I'll share one. Yeah. And it prompted me to have to make a staffing change. So mm -hmm. I like my records, like all the records were just messed up. So it, when I bought my practice, they used to keep the ledger in triplicate. It was like, uh, like on like in a, these little cardboard things, like a Rolodex looking thing. And then there was yeah. like something else. And then it was sort of indentrix. And I had somebody come in to kind of help clean it up because I wanted everything centralized within Dentrix. And my, much to my dismay, I had $14 million of unclosed insurance claims because for the history of having Dentrix, they, they just never closed a claim. Like they just didn't know to do it, just never did it, whatever. And I was like, my goodness, like this is number one, like kind of scary. Also, the record keeping and the, the accounting for the practice was so bad that I was like, did I even pay the right amount for this freaking behemoth? Like, what did I do? And I ended up having to make a major staffing change as a result because they had no clue that this like was not okay. And so, yeah, I feel like um, for me, David, you're so positive. And I think that's why I adore you because you're like, so all the things that I'm not like, I was so mad and I was like, what do I need to do? I got to fix this. And um, yeah, I think it's one of those things that it's a it's a smack in the face reality. But I think sometimes we need that to move into a direction that's going to set us up for success. Gosh, I mean, we spend our whole life in in education preparing for this job with zero in, like, in knowledge about business, and then all of a sudden, when things don't go well, you know, we're kind of backtracking and whatever. But I love these phases where you can kind of you know, see where you're at and obviously grow in a, like a, an intentional way. And I think that that's something that works for a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, whatever your emotion is, 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 is a practice owner, that's the right emotion because it's authentically you. I think, um, when we own it, whatever that emotion, you know, negative, positive, happy, sad, then we've got an opportunity to fix it. So I don't know how 30 minutes just blew by FYI. Um, but it, but it did. So John, this is amazing. Um, mm. this is amazing information. How do, how do our listeners, how do our viewers find you? What's the best way? How do they meet Pat? Yeah. How do they meet Pat? <laughs> how do they meet Pat? Is it, uh, simply to go to, uh, amplify360.com and there's a simple form that you could fill out. If you want to know more about Pat or know, you know, want to understand these four phases, we're, we're not here to sell you anything. We're here to get you healthy, just like you are with your patients. Sure, there might be some marketing strategy and components that we might do to help you to take it to the next level. But our goal is all about education and really to give you the freedom to be able to practice the way that you wanted to back in dental school. Amazing. There well, was a dream at one point. I know, right? <laughs> it's like now that we're like old and in it and jaded, we're like, what the hell? But no, I think uh, <laughs> that's not even true. In fact, I love dentistry more and more with each passing year. That's mm. actually 100% true. 
honest truth. So, all right, John, thank you so much for joining us. Every time I spend time with you, I'm always so happy. So I look oh, forward sweet. to seeing you again. Well, thank you guys for having me. And man, this is a great jam packed 30 minutes. It flew by, it fell like five. <laughs> It did. It really did. So everybody, join us next week at Dentistry Unmasked. Don't forget to write us a little review if you like us. If you don't, don't tell anybody. And we will see you all next week. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening to the show this week. And thanks to our guests and sponsors on this episode. Please check out our social media at Dr. Pamela underscore Maragliano and at Dental Economics Official. Or you can check me out at Ignite DDS or at Dr. David Rice. And go to dentaleconomics.com to receive dental economics. You can choose to receive DE in print or digitally, and you can also get the details of our Principles of Practice Management Conference on our website. If you have topics or guests or anything you'd like to talk about on the show, send us an email to dentistryunmaskedpodcast at gmail.com, and we will do our very best to make it happen. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.